Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. The role of subsea or submarine cables in the global economy cannot be overemphasized. These fiber optic cables lying under the sea connect countries across the world. And roughly 10 trillion in financial transactions are transmitted through them on a daily basis. In today's feature, let's explore several methods through which the much needed power is generated and how these undersea cables are accessed and repaired. Massive undersea cables are some of the means by which electricity power, telephone calls, and internet connections are transported throughout the world. With approximately 436 submarine cables operating worldwide, stretching over 700,000 miles, undersea cables make instant communications possible, transporting some 95% of the data and voice traffic that crosses international boundaries. Modern submarine cables also transport power from the land to offshore installations and platforms. With such importance, it is therefore necessary for repair and rehabilitation work to be done on these cables for optimum performance. Repair work is also required when these cables get accidentally damaged by shark bites, bottom trawling fishing boats, or the dropping of ship anchors, which sometimes cause damages. In such situations, the cable operator first needs to locate the damaged part of the cable lying on the seabed. A specialized cable ship with a team of underwater cable repairers on board sails out to make the repairs. This team uses a special underwater repair habitat or chamber, which serves as a platform for repairing the damaged cable section on the spot instead of lifting it onto a barge. When lowered, the bottom shell of the stainless steel chamber fits under the cable while the upper shell clamps over it. The water is then evacuated to dry the inside of the habitat, creating a vacuum for the cable. The pressure and humidity inside the habitat is closely monitored from electronic equipment on the ship. The doors of the chamber are just big enough to allow the divers to put in their hands through its rubber padded gloves and repair the cables while looking in through its transparent roof. The chamber is already equipped with an underwater cable repair system and other necessary equipment required to complete the task successfully. Apart from the underwater chamber repair method, damaged subsea cables less than 6,500 feet below the water surface can be repaired by pulling the damaged section into a vessel and repairing them on the surface before resubmerging them. In this case, remotely controlled submersible robots are deployed. Equipped with customized grapnels, they are able to pull the affected sections of the cable back to the ship or barge for easy repairs. However, when a new shore end cable has to be repaired, the cable is pulled out from the seabed onto the shore, then floated by means of plastic floats and a rope connected to a winch on the shore. After the necessary repairs are completed, a specialty-designed diver-assisted water jet trencher buries the cable back into the sea at a depth of between 3 to 7 feet. The development of offshore wind farms has also necessitated the use of subsea cables to carry low-voltage control signals, data, and communication signals. Cables must constantly be inspected for efficiency.
Unmanned aerial vehicles launched from the decks of support vessels are also used to inspect the offshore wind farms for data collection. These UAVs can inspect the wind turbines in minimum time, acquiring super high-definition photographs of all the blade surface and other components of the wind turbine. The collected images are then stored in a database and processed through an imaging software that allows quick detection and reporting of all damages. Usually for the purpose of maintenance and repair of offshore wind turbines, helicopters are used to transfer personnel and cargo to the concerned substation, which is usually hundreds of feet above sea level. To execute this operation, maintenance crew undergo special training, including modules like helicopter underwater evacuation training, tower rescue training, and helicopter hoist operation training. Flying offshore for helicopter hoist operations in wind turbines is a very challenging task, even for the pilot. Once the helicopter arrives and remains hovering due to lack of landing space, the hoist operator lowers the hoist cable. The crewman then hooks himself to the hoist cable end and is safely hoisted up onto the helicopter. Then, the second crewman attaches all the cargo from the station to the hoist cable and lastly, hooks himself also to the hoist cable and is safely hoisted to the helicopter. Using offshore floating photovoltaic or PV systems to convert sunlight into electricity using semiconducting materials is also an emerging technology. A solar PV system is placed directly on top of floating structures moored to the seabed. These systems have a higher efficiency rate than land-based solar panel systems. In the United States alone, solar-generated electricity is projected to climb from 11% of total U.S. renewable energy generation in 2017 to 48% by 2050 making it the fastest growing electricity source. Back on land, the hydroelectric power station also stands out as a very popular power source. It uses turbines powered by rushing water to generate electricity. The rushing water rotates the turbine, which then rotates a metal shaft in an electric generator. Hydroelectric plants provide 19% of the world's total electricity supply and are used in over 150 countries across the globe to drive development goals. With advancements in subsea cable technology and sustainable approaches towards the transportation and usage of energy, one can only wonder what new energy type is coming next and how will it be transported to its waiting end users? That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.